Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program with former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club. I'm coming today uh, to you today from my living room in Santa Clara, California, so we'll call this a fireside chat. The club closed down physically on March 6th, and during the COVID crisis, we've been bringing you live stream programming on almost a daily basis. We hope you've enjoyed the more than 60 online programs to date, and many more planned in the coming weeks. You can find the program schedule on the club's website, commonwealthclub.org, as well as the video and podcast archives of all of the recent programs. We also appreciate you considering donating to the club to help support this program. If you wish to do so, please text the word donate to 415-329-4231. These donations are keeping the club going and enabling us to serve our community during this challenging time. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's guest, Madeleine Albright. In 2001, when Secretary Albright was leaving office as America's first female Secretary of State, interviewers asked her how she wished to be remembered. I don't want to be remembered, she answered. I am still here and have much more I intend to do. I want every stage of my life to be more exciting than the last. And so it has been. Uh, Secretary Albright has continued to write, teach, travel, give speeches, start a business, fight for democracy, help empower women, campaign for political candidates, as well as spend more time with her grandchildren. Her new memoir, entitled Hell and Other Destinations, written, of course, before the COVID pandemic, displays her unparalleled wit as well as her profound insights into public events past and present. Today, we'll explore the challenges of our current predicament, as well as hear Madeleine Albright's outlook on history and the post-COVID world. So good afternoon, Secretary Albright. Welcome to this fireside chat. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you very much. Love being in San Francisco area, no matter where and how. <laughs> Virtually or otherwise, we hope to have you back again soon in person. Yeah. And tell us, where are you joining fr us from today? Well, I'm joining from my house in Washington in Georgetown, where I've lived since 1968. And this is my working study, as you can tell, because it's messy. Uh, and um, I have not been out except kind of to do laps around my garden for the last six weeks. Uh, I'm not having uh, much success because I'm an extrovert. And I'm trying to learn to be an introvert, and I'm not doing very well at that. But uh, I've been busy, and uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about my my new book, uh, part of my virtual book tour. And I assume you've been participating in Zoom of events and conversations and other activities. How are you finding that? Are you adapting to it? Is your extroverted self being satisfied by some of that work? Well, actually, I've, I've done a lot of it, and I've enjoyed it, but it doesn't work in terms of the extroverted thing, because you actually see people, but you don't get the vibes. I think one needs to have the vibes, but um, I've been, I finished teaching at Georgetown this semester uh, over Zoom. Uh, we even did a, a game simulation with my students, who were, just did a great job, and I've done a lot of different meetings, so I have done more Zooming than I ever thought I would. Um, and, and it's fun, but it's also, I think you've seen, it's quite tiring because you have to concentrate on it, uh, and, uh, and you don't get the vibes, frankly. Yes, I'm finding that the day goes from 5 or 6 a.m. until 11 p.m. without a break when working at home. Yeah. So I know it's a day early, but happy birthday. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's kind of a weird way to spend it, but, um, uh, um, I think I'll tell you what I'm finding uh, more difficult than I thought. A lot of the book is to kind of prove that I'm not old, as you pointed out at the beginning. And all of a sudden, as a result of the virus, and um, I'm in all of a sudden, I have to be identified as elderly, um, which is was not my idea that I, I've been trying to fight gravity. So uh, uh, it makes the birthday kind of more poignant, if I may say so. 
Well, as a treasure in our country, I'm glad that you are sheltering carefully and safely, even if it means being identified as in a protected class. <laughs> so um, the pin of the day, what is it and what's the significance? Oh, and it's interesting because um, I had a different pin that I thought I was going to wear through this whole book tour, which was a devil. Um, and uh, because uh, things have changed, when I chose the title, it actually had a lot to do with the most famous thing I ever said, which was there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. But given what's going on, it now, um, the hell, I didn't focus on how germane the title was going to be. In my book, I do talk about the fact that I spent World War II in London with my parents all through the Blitz. And my father was a Czechoslovak diplomat uh, who went to work for the government in exile. And his job was to talk over BBC. And so um, I would listen to BBC. I was a little girl. And I'll never forget that the BBC broadcasts always began with a kettle drum that uh, played the first five notes of Beethoven's fifth, da 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 dum which is Morse code for victory. And so I thought that it made sense to, to wear the V-pin uh, for victory. That's how apropos. <clears throat> I, there are people now planting COVID gardens instead of victory gardens. And that theme I think is very important in our society right now. Um, I recall, and you mentioned in the very early part of your book that your code name was when a uh, secretary of state was Pathfinder. And uh, we certainly need some help finding our path in this current situation. Well, there's an awful lot that is hard to figure out because it really is quite different um, in terms of the things that we all have dealt with. And um, I thought when I was secretary of state, I was the last secretary of state of the 20th century and the first of the 21st. And President Clinton was always building bridges to the 21st century. And I think that we thought it was going to kind of be uh, an extra large 20th century in terms of our various relationships and the international organizations and how we operated. And I think now we do have to find a path through something that is quite different. I think that we're going to have to figure out um, all those uh, cliche terms, the new normal or whatever. But I do think that things will be different. Can you say a little bit more about in what ways and what directions will they be different? Well, I think that um, there are several aspects that are going on. I've often talked about mega trends and their downside. So what we've been living through as, uh, through as a mega trend is globalization. We've all benefited from it to some form or another, I think. Um, but it does have a downside. It's faceless. And so people... Uh, don't know what their identity is. And we've had an awful lot of people thinking they want to know who they are. Um, they don't want to be part of some faceless organization. Um, and I think it's great to want to know what your identity is. But if my identity hates your identity, uh, it becomes very dangerous and nationalism and hyper-nationalism. And that's something that we're dealing with. The other mega trend is that uh, technology, which again, we've all benefited. And I always love to talk about the Kenyan woman farmer who no longer has to walk miles to pay her bills because um, she can use her mobile phone and she can have a life um, either with her family or starting a business or running for office. That's the positive. The negative part is that um, every all opinion is disaggregated. Everybody gets their news or their opinions from uh, an echo chamber, and it's very hard to tell what is going on. And those are the things that we have to deal with now. So for instance, the virus knows no borders. And yet all of a sudden, we're into borders and nationalism, when the only way that it's going to be solved is by um, dealing together and trying to solve the problem and understanding um, that, uh, you know, the people are talking about disconnecting. I don't think we can disconnect um, if uh, we're going to be able to operate in the 21st century. And we also need to understand technology better, its pros and cons. So those are the aspects at which me leads me to thinking that I think our greatest hope are the young people who actually um, know how to operate in the technological world and um, who um, 
have uh, a, an exciting view of the future, uh, even though I think it is uh, a little iffy at the moment for them. As I've talked about my grandchildren, I have three, I have six grandchildren and then three of them are in college. And I know how much they were looking forward to being in college. And so it's a little disquieting, I think, for everybody. I want to come back to that question of the interrupted education, but first I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, how, why we didn't know or respond to predictions of uh, a pandemic and weren't prepared. So as you know, there's a brain trust in this country and internationally. You have talk in your book about the many policy studies and groups you've been involved with. Uh, the Atlantic Council and uh, various other groups. And there were a number of groups in recent years that pulled experts together to think about uh, emerging diseases and how they could possibly create a pandemic and what preparedness uh, we needed to do. There was a World Health Organization uh, panel report on this just last September a warning that we needed to engage in vaccine development and uh, develop, uh, you know, better fund our public health agencies and so on. You've seen a lot of policy studies. You've seen their ability to impact government and policy. What was going on this time and why haven't we been able to pay attention and what makes a policy study have impact and enable us to do better? Well, I do think that what, by the way, when I teach at Georgetown, I teach a course about decision making um, and I try not to brainwash my students and I explain that we're an old country and we've made decisions for a long time and there is a process. And, and I think that what happened um, and, and the, the world doesn't come in four year segments according to our election. Um, and I think there was already um, a, uh, a dislike uh, by the Trump administration of coming in after Obama. There had been, it had been an unpleasant uh, campaign. There was already a lot of criticism. One of the things uh, that I have found most interesting about our decision-making process is what's known as the transition. Um, and the transition is a period from the November election to January 21st, the inauguration. And I have been transitioned into, and I've done the transitioning. The latter is more fun but it is an absolutely crucial time because it is a time where um, disagreements are kind of set aside because the crown jewels are being transferred. And from what I've heard, um, it was a very incomplete and unpleasant transition. And there was not that kind of turning things over. Uh, I do know that the Obama administration did in fact have a plan. Um, and why it was disregarded, because they had gone through some difficult times with Ebola um, and trying to figure out how to deal with, with a pandemic. And there were warnings about a pandemic. So uh, I think the hard part is, and there are an awful lot of stories now trying to figure out why all that was ignored uh, and why people that had worked on that were asked to leave. One of the interesting parts, again, from the government often there are people who stay from one administration to another because they are the professionals and are not um, viewed as being, uh, to use the term partisan on this. So I think that some very big mistakes were made. I do think the Chinese have something to answer for um, in terms of what they did or didn't do. I do think also uh, that one has to know more about what the WHO did or didn't do. But as far as I'm concerned, there was kind of a blindness from the incoming administration to this and then uh, denial. And I think it's really is a problem and we are all paying for it now. So for leaving aside who wins the election, partisanship, et cetera, it just sounds like we need a better transition process the next time and to make sure that all the current issues, current views are incorporated and understood by the team coming in. And I think that's something for everyone interested in public policy to pay attention to. It's sort of a little known process. People understand the political process, the elections, et cetera. But there is a time there between November and January that's crucial. Um, now on China, what do you think the Chinese have to answer for? Well, I think that um, they 
um, well, we don't know exactly what happened, but but the bottom line is from what I have read, they punished the people that talked about what was going on in Wuhan. They uh, did not do what they could have and should have in terms of limiting uh, travel and a variety of, uh, you know, trying to figure it out. And they did not. And and again, I, I don't know all the, the facts. All I know is, you know, what I've read. Um, uh, and I think our, the Trump administration has made it even more confusing by changing their mind every other day about what they knew and when they knew it. But I think the Chinese, that does need to be investigated. But what we most have to figure out now is how to move forward on this. Uh, and there are whole questions about whether we should break relations with China, disconnect, uh, um, and not work with them anymore. I hope that doesn't happen. Because just visualize, if the Chinese were the ones to find a vaccine, would we say, no, we don't want it? Um, and so there have to be issues that are rectified. And my own sense about working with China, I, I can't tell you how many meetings, we were talking about task forces and meetings that I've done, how many have to do with China? You know, the, the rising power and uh, how do we deal with it? And, and I think that um, the art of diplomacy and statecraft is being able to have uh, relationships with even those we disagree with, uh, try to figure out where we can cooperate and compete where we have to, uh, and not decide that we're not going to have anything to do with them. Uh, we know the issues of our supply chains, um, and the fact also that the Chinese, as the U.S. has been withdrawing from the world scene, the Chinese are, are filling the vacuum. So um, I think it is counterproductive to decide that uh, we are not going to deal with them. We need to figure out uh, where we cooperate and where we compete. There are a lot of aspects of global cooperation in this current situation. I mean, the Chinese did share the genetic code for the viruses and so on. And there have been uh, d exchange of data and other cooperation. Some people are seeing this as a model for other difficult areas non-proliferation, terrorism, human rights, et cetera. Do you see positive aspects of the cooperation that the pandemic has forced and how they might enable progress in other areas? Well, I do think, first of all, that the virus knows no borders. Um, and then also are issues, you don't have to be a genius to know that there are certain issues that require uh, international cooperation, uh, nuclear proliferation, climate change, um, various health policies um, and uh, aspects of um, the movement of peoples. Um, and it just requires cooperation. And, and I think, I hope that that is something that is followed in a variety of ways. It doesn't mean we have to agree about everything. I can tell you, it's very interesting to be a diplomat because you go to any country and um, if uh, you are a secretary of state that actually um, works with the people in the State Department and is uh, briefed and prepared for meetings, you have uh, a, an objective in going to the country and you have a set of things that you want to talk about. Now, you start out always in a very friendly way um, and you try to find the things you agree on. And then I had a trick. I would say I have come a long way, so I must be frank. Um, and then I would talk about the human rights situation or uh, what was going on in Tibet. And then the Chinese foreign minister would talk about Taiwan. But the bottom line is that um, diplomacy is the language that you need to be able to talk to those with whom you agree and disagree. So I think that the next phase, again, if you look at the uh, trans-border aspect of the problems, we have to deal with the Chinese. Um, and I think then I would prefer to deal with them often within a larger setting uh, so that um, whether they uh, can work with us at the United Nations or to be more part of some of the issues that are happening um, in Asia. I am troubled by what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea. They are uh, threatening navigational rights and I'm very worried about an accident in terms of some ship, um, um, Chinese ship hitting a, uh, uh, a fisher, fishing boat or something, and whether we have lines that are open that can deal with these kinds of issues. It would be very dangerous um, if we had a Cold War with the Chinese. 
Coming back to the U.S. situation for a second, uh, you have experienced government in every way. You're a real authority on the way the U.S. government works. A number of people, including Margaret Hamburg, Harvey Feinberg, have called for a, a single uh, point of uh, you know, control or contact for the pandemic uh, management in the U.S. government, a pandemic czar, if you will. will. And they've mentioned people like former secretaries of HHS, former members of Congress, even Ash Carter was mentioned once. What do you think of this idea? Do we need a national czar or coordinator other than the vice president to deal with the pandemic crisis in this country? I think it would be very useful because um, there's accountability and responsibility. But if there is such a person, a czar or a czarina, um, that it would be an understanding that it takes a, a lot of parts of the U.S. government to be a part of this. Obviously, um, health and human services, but uh, it, it is a national security issue. Um, it is a commercial issue. Um, and so if the person is empowered to be the one that gathers the people um, in the White House in order to follow this very carefully, uh, then I think that's important. The other part about our government, and I feel very strongly about this, is um, what makes it so interesting for me, the most interesting part of our government are executive legislative relations. Um, and so there has to be a way that the White House deals with respect with members of Congress. I've been on both ends of this. I worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Muskie, and then I came and worked in the Carter White House doing congressional relations. So it was interesting to see how things went back and forth. But I do think that it's important to be able to have that relationship, and then obviously also a judicial branch. And so um, the interaction of our government is important and understanding the Constitution. So, uh, and those are the things that seem to be missing at the moment. By the way, the course I teach, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. So what are the tools? And my course is called the National Security Toolbox. And we are the most powerful country in the world, but there are not a lot of tools. But all the tools in order to really work need to be activated and worked on with the Congress. And so that if there is a czar or czarina, that is an important part. Um, and then the really hard part, especially in this administration, is somebody who can go into the president and say, these are the facts. Um, and if you want to make sure that people aren't dying, uh, these are the facts. And Believe me, it is not easy to go into the Oval Office and talk to the president. Um, there's so much history in the Oval Office. I had a lot of, you know, I would go in and brief President Clinton, and sometimes I'd get irritated because he'd be doing a crossword puzzle as I was talking to him. But he had the capability, having done a lot of reading about what we were about to do and what foreign leader we were going to see. So he always had been listening and asked the right questions. But it's not simple to go in there and tell the president of the United States, you've got these facts wrong. You mentioned at the beginning uh, what's lost when we're operating remotely. And the way that government operates, and really any organization, a lot happens outside of formal meetings. Chatting in the hallway at the proverbial water cooler, uh, the walk in the woods um, in international meetings and so on. What do you think is lost and how long can we go on in a mode where we're not meeting face to face? I, I think it, a lot is lost, by the way, and in those personal relations. It's interesting. I was just uh, um, at we couldn't have a hearing on this on Capitol Hill because it was remote. And so I did a briefing with the House Foreign Affairs Committee last week um, uh, on democracy and authoritarianism. Um, it was interesting to the extent, I mean, there are a lot of people that I know from various parts of my life, um, and there it's possible to kind of have a less formal interaction, but it's different than if you're kind of walking down the hall or you come and see them. I do think that um, I'm troubled by what the long-term effect of uh, this kind of sequestration uh, you know, takes place. But I think if it takes um, a lot longer, we will develop other ways of, of trying to figure out how to have the relationships. 
social distancing doesn't mean, um, you know, personal distancing in terms of relationships. You can always pick up the phone. So I was going to ask you about how the government is working in this uh, period. And you've talked about doing a remote briefing for a House committee. Have you, do you have any other sense of how government is operating right now? Well, I, I think uh, not at the best, I have to say, because um, it's very, so much of government um, is based on uh, trying to see the other person's side and to look at compromise. And at the moment, what troubles me very deeply about the current um, way, the atmosphere, is that there is a premium on um, uh, putting down your opponent and not really listening to what uh, he or she has to say uh, when you actually can learn something from people with whom you disagree. And so um, I don't think things are going very well. I, I uh, do think it, it's kind of a, a zero sum instead of trying to figure out how to find some kind of a compromise. So I, I am worried about this going on. On the other hand, I think we have to be aware of the fact that as a result of the things that we started talking about, why it took so long and what the issues were, we do have to worry about the number of people um, that are dying uh, and that, in fact, the health of the country, the health of our people is something that uh, is obviously um, of paramount importance, which goes back to science and facts and, and, and what the policies are. So um, the subject on which you testified, which is uh, democracy and authoritarianism, was the topic of your book, A Fascism, A Warning, which was a very striking book and caused a lot of people to pay attention and think about that subject, that is the rise of authoritarianism or even totalitarianism globally. What, what did you say in your testimony and uh, how do you think things are going? Uh, do you see that trend continuing to deepen worldwide? Well, I do. And it goes back to the uh, when I was talking about trends and their downside. I think what we're seeing um, is that the rise of this hyper-nationalism does create divisions. Um, and just to go back, uh, when I decided to write my book on fascism, I went to see the origin of it. And it started with Mussolini um, in Italy after World War I, where the Italians felt that they had not, their role in World War I when they fought with the Allies was not respected. There were economic problems. Uh, Mussolini was somebody that was an outsider who came in, who was a very good speaker, could motivate people. Uh, and what happened was he began to identify with one group of people at the expense of another. Uh, and then Hitler picked that up and uh, went way beyond anything in terms of not only dividing society, but blaming the group that he didn't like of being um, the problem, the whole problem. Uh, in terms of its scapegoat for, for everything. Now, the best quote in that book came from Mussolini, uh, which uh, he said, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. Um, and so I've been saying there's a lot of feather plucking going on right now. Uh, and by the way, you can't say those two words too quickly together, but uh, really uh, very worrisome in terms of steps. And we've seen it in Europe. What I did in that book, and I <clears throat> talk about it a little bit more in, in uh, this new one, is what happened in Europe. So <clears throat> you find somebody like Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary, whom I actually met in the 80s um, when he was everybody's favorite dissident. And by the way, he's been attacking George Soros. George Soros paid for his education um, at Oxford. So, um, and anyway, he has taken advantage of some of the problems in Hungary, um, the fact that uh, immigrants have come in and, uh, and also uh, the virus, uh, in order all of a sudden to um, have what he calls an illiberal democracy. If there ever was an oxymoron is putting two words like that together. The Poles are doing things like that also. I'm very worried about what's happened in Turkey or uh, in the Philippines. And so there are those leaders that are taking advantage of the fact that there are problems to divide the people even more. And, and I am worried that some of that, um, there is an attempt to divide our society. 
Uh, and and I think what I did in, in the fascism book, fascism is not an ideology. It's a process for gaining power. And it's when you have a leader who thinks he's above the law, uh, where the freedom of the press, a free press is the basis of democracy. And if all of a sudden the press is seen as the enemy of the people, that is a, a terrible aspect of it. And then the scapegoating part. So um, I am, what, which is why I wrote the book, A Warning, because one has to be careful about the divisions that have taken place. So um, we in this country are accepting a lot more government authority at the moment and glad of it in many cases. And we're providing information ranging from our location to our body temperature, et cetera. Uh, what do you think of this in terms of the uh, trends in the US, so the ability to preserve civil rights, democracy, et cetera? Is this troubling at all? Well, I have to say, so uh, I, I am gonna sound like Professor Albright here, but basically um, there, the way that modern societies were created was with a social contract. And basically people gave up some of their individual rights to a government uh, that then had the responsibility of providing a series of social services and worrying about the people. And in exchange, the people uh, were good citizens and voted and were interested in what was going on. I have been troubled that the social contract has been breaking down and some of it does have to do with technology and the loss of jobs and a variety of things that were going on um, at the beginning of this century and the fear factor about terrorists and any number of different aspects. What is interesting and you already stated it is in order to deal with the pandemic, the central government does have to have some power um, that if every, uh, and we particularly have an interesting constitution with the powers of the states, but there are certain things that the federal government needs to be responsible for. And um, the loss of some of the democracy there is something that I think is necessary. On the other hand, there has to be a method uh, for the voice of the people to be heard um, and we are about to be able to be heard in our elections. Uh, and I think that democracy is not a spectator sport. And I think that we have to understand how the electoral system works here, how important it is to have access uh, to the voting system. The states run a lot of it. And it makes it necessary for everybody to understand how the political system operates and our role in it. But you do need, we've been criticizing the central government for not having had a supply of ventilators or masks. Um, and there have been a lot of questions about where they come from. So I think our system in many ways needs work, but not by people that wanna destroy the system uh, in order to create some kind of weird society, but in fact, one that mends some of the problems and recognizes the importance of that social contract. So while we're sheltering, we should be paying even more attention to our governmental bodies, how they're working and our vote to vote and uh, voting should be made as accessible as possible. I think I agree with you. There's a special need at this time to pay attention to the levers of our democracy. Um, let's talk about students. Uh, you finished the semester teaching via Zoom. Um, I'm on the board of my undergraduate college, so we talk about this all the time. Will there be a fall semester? What are students missing uh, by uh, not being able to physically be present? What do you think the impact will be? Will this be a shaping experience for the college and graduate school age population? What will they take away from this? How will this impact their lives? Well, they will never forget this. There's no question, especially seniors who are missing their graduation or those that were prepared to step into jobs that um, either don't exist or have to be done virtually. And so they are um, on the front lines of this in many different ways. What I found interesting with my students, and um, I do teach this decision-making course, and one of the things that's been their favorite thing has been a role-play simulation, which I have done in the past um, over a weekend. Um, and it's very... Um, uh, something that is intensive. Uh, I have I asked them to prepare like six weeks ahead of time. 
There's some people who play uh, the, are the main decision-making body of uh, the National Security Council, the Principles Committee. And then I have a group that play the United Nations Security Council. And then I have foreigners that are representing whatever country we're dealing with. So what had they had prepared to do was about Venezuela. Um, and I always create some crisis towards the end that they have to deal with that they weren't prepared for. So what I did was to say that an American ship was captured by the Venezuelans, and it was a ship that was delivering humanitarian assistance. And all of this was done remotely. Um, and they managed to, uh, and it, again, it's a cliche, they managed to take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity. And they figured out how to deal with the ship issue, but then they began to look at what were the relationships in Venezuela, how did they relate to the Colombians and the Cubans and the refugees? And so they made the best of it. And I think in many ways, the students, that generation is most prepared of anybody to deal with technology. Uh, the truth is we'd been criticizing them for being online all the time and not uh, being social enough or not understanding privacy. Uh, in many ways, they are more prepared for this. And so, um, you know, I, I'm often asked if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot, but um, I'm an optimist because of that generation. And so I do think they're in a, in a hard spot. I think as of right now, most of them don't know if there's going to be um, school in the fall um, and they have to try to figure it out. I think it's, a, it's and I have, I have six grandchildren, three of whom are college age. And I know they loved being in college just because it's more than just going to class and they, they know they're missing something. But I also think that in many ways they can be the ones that will, uh, with our help, lead us out of this. So let's go to the title of your book for a second. Um, the, uh, there's a special place in hell. And this is a tough question because as you know, uh, there's a, uh, a, an accusation of, about Joe Biden at this point uh, with regard to his behavior towards a former Senate aide. Uh, how do you react to this situation uh, where we may need a change in our leadership, uh, but there is this, this concern? Well, I do think that one of the issues is that um, uh, I believe that when women make accusations, we need to believe them and let them speak out. But I also do think that there needs to be a way of figuring out what is true and not true. Um, I happen to know, I've known Joe Biden for a very long time from the time that he was a senator. Uh, I think he is somebody, I, I happen to think that um, uh, I believe him. Uh, I do think it's very good that he's decided that he wants to have a woman vice president, uh, uh, which I think, by the way, I uh, back in all the various things I've done, um, I, uh, when Walter Mondale chose Geraldine Ferraro to be his vice presidential candidate was the first time, and I was her um, foreign policy advisor. So we spent a lot of time with each other. Um, and, and this is where some of my statements about women come from that were so hard on each other, very judgmental. Um, and, and we sometimes project our sense of inadequacy on another woman. And I remember traveling with her and um, a woman came up and said, how can she deal with a Russian? I can't deal with a Russian. Well, nobody was asking that woman to do that. And, and I think that we're not supportive enough of each other. So it does mean listening to those who feel that they have been sexually harassed or misunderstood. But I think it's also very important uh, to figure out what the truth really is and to make judgments about what you know about the people involved. I apologize when I seem to look at my lap. I have the questions coming in from the audience on an iPad, and I'm going to ask a few of those now. Um, uh, one person wants to know, say, thank you for being a positive role model for young women. What's your advice for young women today? Well, um, I, uh, I think the following thing, which is that, um, first of all, we need to... Um, I need to know the following thing, that women do have to work harder than men. There's no question. Uh, this is going to irritate some of the men in, that are listening. There's plenty of room in the world for mediocre men. There's no room for mediocre women. 
and women have to work very hard. I also think that it is very important um, to know you're not going to be able to plan your whole life out uh, ahead of time. I think you need to know what uh, makes you, would make you a useful member of society? What are you interested in? Are you somebody that will work hard, that will be dependable, um, that will know how to do something that women have to do is to multitask um, and to understand that you are better off if there's more than one woman in the room. But I think the main thing is to understand that it's very hard to plan your whole life out. If anybody had told me, um, how my life developed, I would have said, no way. I mean, I was somebody that went to a women's college. I wanted to be a journalist. Um, and I uh, worked a, uh, on a small paper while my husband was in the army. And then we moved back to Chicago where he worked on a newspaper and we're sitting with his managing editor and he looks at me and he says, so what are you gonna do, honey? And I said, I'm gonna work on a newspaper. And he said, I don't think so. You can't work on the same paper as your husband. and even though there were three other papers in Chicago at the time, he said, and you wouldn't want to compete with your husband, so go find something else to do. Uh, what I can tell you, and I won't go through the whole story, I found something um, in my papers of, that I wrote. Um, I, I had twins early, and I uh, wanted to go back to school, and I, and I uh, wrote this little essay that said, um, I can't believe it, I'm obsolete. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and so uh, it, it all turned out somewhat differently, but I really do think we need to take advantage of the fact that our life comes in segments due to biology um, and to be able to uh, do what, I mean, for me, I always wanted to do something as you quoted in the beginning, something interesting and to have a curiosity and, and to give it my all and to be dependable and then also not think that certain things were beneath me. Uh, when I was a staffer, I made a lot of coffee and Xeroxed. And, and I know that when I was made Secretary of State, uh, by the way, uh, when my name came up to be Secretary of State, um, somebody said, well, a woman can't be Secretary of State because Arab leaders won't deal with a woman. Well, that went away. And what it turned out, I had less trouble with foreign leaders because they knew that I represented the United States than I did with the men in our own government. Um, who knew me too long as um, a staffer or somebody who cooked, I'd had them over for dinner or, you know, and they thought, how did she get to be Secretary of State? So the main thing that I think is women, there's no point in being angry. The point is to do work and recognize that you have to work harder um, and that, uh, and you have to speak up. And finally, my mantra is in meetings, you have to interrupt. Uh, because if you raise your hand, then by the time they get to you, um, what you're going to say is not germane. And I, there's not a woman that I've ever talked to who um, hasn't had this feeling of you want to say something in a meeting and you think, well, I won't say it because it'll sound stupid. And then some man says it and everybody thinks it's brilliant and you're mad at yourself. So I invented the idea that uh, made it up active listening. If you're listening to in order to interrupt, you have to know what you're going to say and you have to have a strong voice and do it. And when I went to teaching, I told my students, because I had co-ed classes, nobody could raise their hands. Um, everybody had to interrupt. My classes were a bit of a zoo, but I, I do think that it's very important uh, to, to know what you're gonna say. And it's much better if there's another woman in the room to support what you said. I think actually the American diplomacy has played a good role in certain periods by sending women into areas of the world where women don't hold as high level or responsible positions. And then the country that we're dealing with has to deal with us, with women. And it essentially shows that uh, it forces the issue and it shows that women have to be dealt with and perhaps should have more high level positions in those countries as well. By the way, you know what's interesting, since we started talking about the pandemic, the countries that are run by women currently have done better dealing with the pandemic. Uh, New Zealand um, and Germany and um, then Denmark and Norway and uh, Iceland. 
uh, Taiwan, very interesting. And the qualities that women have, I think, in terms of multi being able to multitask uh, because we have peripheral vision, knowing that it is uh, better to take care of people and that you don't want your children pitted against each other. You want people to work together. It's kind of interesting to think about the fact. And, and by the way, the U.S. also always wants to be number one in everything. There are countries uh, that have had women presidents and prime ministers, and we're the ones that are kind of behind in this. So uh, sounds like a great topic for a paper at the graduate level or, or some research on uh, how women-led countries have done. So um, you told a number of personal stories in your book. In fact, in some ways, it could be called Madeleine Albright Uncensored because there are a number of uh, wonderful stories there. Uh, for instance, the requirement for women to be photographed at Wellesley. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if you want to repeat any of these, but um, again, tremendously witty and, and uh, observant in uh, pointing out some of these experiences. Well, the thing that happened at Wellesley when we got there, we all had to have our posture pictures taken. Um, and, um, you know, that you weren't fully dressed for that. Um, and if you didn't have good posture, you had to have classes and exercise. And we all kind of wondered what had ever happened to the posture pictures until we found out that they were in a vault at Yale. So um, it was a little bit embarrassing. Um, but... I have some really crazy stories and some of them um, that are fun in terms of um, how I've had uh, uh, people not have a clue who I am and think that I'm somebody else. Um, and on an airplane, I, and this is a story where um, I was flying on a plane that was very fancy and had a, a bar just as I, just in front of the bathroom. So I'm going to the bathroom and all of a sudden there are these men there who are saying, kind of looking at me and one kneels down and he says, can you bless me? And I and, and he said, please bless me. And he put his head right so that I could bless him. I then figured out he thought I was Mother Teresa. Um, and so I didn't go to the bathroom that way anymore. Or somebody who thought I was Margaret Thatcher. Um, and I said, I'm not. And this man said, yes, you are. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not. And he said, if you don't want to tell me you're Margaret Thatcher, that's fine, but I know you are. Or my very best moment at Heathrow Airport, which many people have gone through and is pretty tough. Um, I am the one that's picked out in order to uh, take everything out of my suitcase and I'm on the floor and people are waiting and, and I'd never do this, but I finally said, excuse me, but do you know who I am? And the guy doing this said, no, but we have a doctor who can help you figure it out. Uh, <laughs> It was hard not to laugh. So I've had a lot of funny stories. Also some very poignant stories um, about finding the letter from, or the diary from your grandmother, and I'd, which you actually include some of as an appendix in your book. Could you tell us that story? Yes, and I'll tell you, it's, it takes a little while. What happened was that um, I didn't know, uh, by the way, I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out I was Jewish. So I can have my own spiritual discussions. Um, and uh, one of the things was that um, what happened was we spent the war in England. Um, then we went back to Czechoslovakia. And I had, I was two when we left. And so while I had seen pictures of myself with my grandmother, I, I don't ever remember having a real contact with her. Um, and, and when we got back, there was no family in Czechoslovakia. And we came to the United States as very much of a nuclear family. Um, so what happened was my father died and he had a lot of different papers and things. And when my mother moved to Washington, she brought everything with her. And when she died, all of a sudden, everything ended up in my garage and I was trying to figure out what all these things were. And then what happened was I go into a public life and I have security um, and they kind of move into my, ho my house and garage. And they said, we've got to get rid of these boxes. You've got to put them somewhere. So I found a, some, uh, a storage uh, place and we put everything there. And then um, something came up in terms of my papers generally and my father had 
been working on a book and I thought I should go at least look at stuff. And um, as I'm there, I find, um, and amidst all these papers, uh, an envelope, an old man manila envelope. And when I open it, there's a diary in it. And I start looking at it and it was written in Czech and it was um, letters. Uh, it was done in the form of letters to my mother from her mother. And it kind of uh, it blew, there's no way to describe it in terms of uh, how I felt about it. And, um, and then I felt, I, you know, my mother had never talked about it uh, and how she must have felt and how she even got it at a certain stage. I think I, I can track it a little bit more now, um, but it was a diary that began in 1942 um, and it doesn't have a lot in it in terms of, um, because she describes her life in this little town where she lived. And a lot of it was very mundane in terms of her daily activities of going shopping or washing her hair. Um, and she'd always say, and how is little Madlenka? And very, you know, we miss her. And, and then she said in one um, uh, uh, in entry, all of a sudden people are talking about Aryans and non-Aryans. She said she'd never heard that term before or that there were places that Jews were not able to shop or um, that, that all of a sudden there was an order that people had to give their warm clothes to the Nazi soldiers. And it, it kind of blew my mind, the whole thing. And I thought of it as kind of a message in a bottle um, that was uh, a message from the past with some very deep insights and, and a sense of hope about seeing each other all again. And, um, and I'm very glad I found it, uh, but it was not easy to kind of go through and, and recognize the suffering that my relatives had gone through. I, I then, uh, when I found out about being Jewish, I, I was just as I was starting to be Secretary of State and I couldn't go and put the story together. So my brother and sister went to uh, Czechoslovakia at the time and began to put the story together. Um, and then we've done more research and it turns out that 26 members of my family died in concentration camps. And so two summers ago now, three summers ago, I took my children and grandchildren um, to Prague and then to Terezin um, in order to show them uh, what was our past. And you were able to put a plaque there, I think, in the village? Yeah. Now in Terezinstadt, which is one of the most, uh, all concentration camps are disgusting, but this was portrayed as a spa um, that um, they thought that uh, Czech, well, Czech Jews would want to go to. And it, it was kind of a villagey place. Um, and they did have an orchestra and a variety of things, but then they shipped people off to other concentration camps. And they also did have some terrible things that happened at Terezin itself. I'm so sorry. Uh, that must have been a difficult experience to go through the discovery and finding out what happened. But um, I'm glad I found the diary. I really, and that's the, the message in the bottle part about it. So uh, the single most important thing you feel that you've done since leaving office. Well, I think um, there's not one single thing because the purpose of writing this book in many ways was showing how the things I do go together and how one thing informs another. Um, and I've talked about teaching. I love doing that. But I love doing the things that have to do with democracy. Um, I was recently at a dinner and I was asked to describe myself in six words. And I said, a worried optimist a problem solver and a grateful American. And they go together. And, um, and I think I, the motivating factor of my life, whether I knew it or not, because you asked that earlier, is to pay back. I am a grateful American. Um, and my, as I've said, large numbers of my family died. Uh, my father, we left Czechoslovakia a second time when the communists took over. And I kind of wonder what it would have been like had he not managed uh, to get us out of there. Um, and so coming to America has been the dispositive aspect of my life. And, and so, um, and the things that I do kind of come from that, 
And the amount of time I spend on democracy through the National Democratic Institute and understanding that in order to make a difference in a country, we need to work on helping them on a political system and an economic system because democracy has to deliver. People wanna vote and eat um, and try to figure out how to operate, um, and even this was before the pandemic, and how not to let nationalism uh, morph into um, fascism and hatred even more. So that's my main thing. And by the way, I, I always love to talk about this, which is that one of my favorite activities is to give naturalization certificates and ceremonies. And the first time I did it was July 4th, 2000 at Monticello. Um, I figured since I had Thomas Jefferson's job, I could actually do that. And so I am giving this man his naturalization certificate and he walks away and I hear him say, can you believe I'm a refugee and I just got my naturalization certificate from the secretary of state. And I go up to him and I say, can you believe that a refugee is secretary of state? And so I am grateful and I now am concerned about the fact that the Statue of Liberty is weeping given some of our policies when most of the people in this country came in some form or another from some other country. Well, that leads us to another audience question, which is if you disagree with American foreign policy uh, positions, how can a citizen best try to affect the outcome? Well, I think that first of all, uh, by understanding uh, what the policy is about, where it comes from. And then um, I think being vocal about what you disagree with and then take steps um, that would lead to a change. Um, and I think uh, it's, from my perspective, I, I think it's sometimes good to be an individual voice, but it's good to find people that you can work with to, to uh, make your point of view clearer but the main thing is to vote. That is the process. And, 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 I'm, and I think now that um, there's all the influence of hacking and, um, and a variety of aspects of the social media and lack of uh, a way um, to make sure that things work, it's the numbers that are gonna make the difference in terms of making sure that the, the voice is the vote. But it also requires, and I feel very strongly about this, that um, one has to call out what one sees if uh, people think they're above the law. I think also, and, and this is not always easy, I had my to-do list when I was talking about my fascism book, was to talk to people with whom you disagree. Um, I decided that I, I don't like the word tolerance. That's to put up with, tolerate. I think we need to respect other people's views and try to figure out where they're coming from, and then have a discussion about, can you um, find some way to work together? And then I really do think seeing what, uh, how to work with the next generation. Uh, but I think some of us that are um, not as adept at uh, uh, the new technology need to work with the younger generation and need to figure out how to make sure that we know what's going on and to question. Um, I don't happen to uh, I'm not big on violent demonstrations, uh, but I do think that it's very important to speak out um, and to try to find a way, a democratic way, to get your views across and tell the truth. So I've been thinking, once we are able to be around other people again, um, there are greetings that we do, and in the U.S., a handshake is the typical greeting. Different cultures around the world greet each other in different ways. What are you thinking? How are you thinking you're going to be greeting people once sheltering is over? I am uh, a hugger. Um, and, and one of the things, by the way, you'll get a laugh out of this. I invented the art of um, diplomatic kissing. So what happened when I came in, you can't visualize former secretaries doing this, of going to a country and you know, having an embrace. So more complicated than meets the eye because in Latin America, some people kiss on the right cheek and some on the left cheek and- uh, Some two or three times. And then bump noses and then the French kiss twice and the Dutch kiss three times. And then there was Yasser Arafat, how just the thought of it, right? So 
anyway, um, I did, uh, there were in fact embraces uh, and and I and I I don't know how it's going to work. I've I've tried even before we were all sequestered to do the elbow bump, uh, but I think we are going to have to figure out some other way to to make clear our respect for the people that we're meeting. I think the Japanese bow is a is yeah. a good. One. Anything I haven't asked you that you would like to say to our audience? Well, I think that. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the questions and from the audience questions. I think we are in a very peculiar time, and it's going to be very important for us to try to sort out what we do think and not necessarily to agree on everything, but to understand that um, democracy is fragile um, and at the same time, it's resilient. And I think we have to think about how to use the resilience. Um, the optimism and the desire to work together, um, and that um, there's no one individual that can solve problems. I think that we have to to uh, work together, um, and it's not going to be easy. But the worst part, I think, is if people decide that there's nothing to be done. Um, I am not passive. I, and one has to be active, an activist, uh, on behalf of causes that are uh, ones that open up society and respect uh, uh, each other, but it's not it, not simple. And I think the hard part at the moment is this is all lasting longer than we thought. Um, I think we all kind of figured that at some stage, uh, uh, you know, uh, this would be over fairly quickly and patience is not my virtue. And so I think we have to sort out uh, how we proceed through this um, and what is the appropriate behavior for people that are proud of living in a democracy? So um, thank you for the passion, expertise, and good humor with which you've done all that you've done. You've contributed so much over the decades. Uh, in your book, you talk about Madeline's clubs, all the various groups you belong to and have assembled uh, from the Aspen Institute, Brookings, Count CFR, Carnegie Endowment, your various working groups, your company, and so on. In a slightly different way, we are very happy to be the Commonwealth Club to be one of your clubs. We are very much your fans and had the great honor of honoring you with our Distinguished Citizen Award last year. We miss seeing you in person, but we're so grateful to you for joining us from Washington today for this Commonwealth Club program. Uh, stay well, shelter successfully. Um, I hope it, there's some diversion uh, to uh, uh, alleviate the isolation there. And again, thank you so much, Secretary Albright. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I've always felt very welcome. Um, and anytime you want me, I'm there. And, and I think it's a great club um, in a great city. Um, and, um, and I think it's wonderful. And uh, I am always delighted to be invited and to have a, a good conversation. Thank you very much. We'll ask you frequently. We want to remind everyone watching that you can get a copy of Secretary Albright's book, unfortunately not physically at the Commonwealth Club today. Uh, it's called Hell and Other Destinations, but you can get it at your local bookstore or by visiting barnesandnoble.com. This program has been part of the club's Good Lit series, which is underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We're thankful to all of our viewers online. As I noted earlier, the club will continue to provide live stream programming in the days ahead. Please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to learn more or to donate. I'm Gloria Duffy. Now this online program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.